the following presentation is part of the Agronomy and Horticulture Seminar Series at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Xiaoming Yu. Dr. Xiaoming Yu is a professor and a pioneer distinguished chair in maize breeding in the Department of Agronomy at Iowa State University. His research integrates knowledge in plant breeding, quantitative genetics, genomics, molecular genetics, statistics, with the ultimate goal of developing and implementing new strategies and methods in trade dissection and crop improvement. Prior to joining ISU, he worked, in a, he worked as an assistant and associate professor at the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University. His, a little bit about his education. Uh, he obtained his MS in agronomy at Kansas State University and uh, his PhD in applied plant sciences at the University of Minnesota and postdoctoral research associate uh, briefly for one year at Minnesota and two years at Cornell University. And this was amazing. So he's, he has more than 18 prestigious honors and awards. I cannot name all of them. I'll just say that those are awards during graduate studies. They are early career professional awards. They are young crop scientist awards by the Crop Science Society. And he has multiple mid-career achievement awards. He's the fellow of CSSA and the AAAS. And in 2018, he was recognized as the highly cited researcher by Clarivate Analytics. He has presented more than 88 invited talks at both national and international level. He's published wi widely in pretty much every high profile journal, Nature Genetics, Nature Communication, Nature Plants, PNAS, Genetics, you can probably name it all. There's all of them. And his work has been cited more than 12,500 times so far. And what was most impressing personally is that many of his research, many of his recent publications have pretty much led to a new novel and innovative approach for addressing uh, research problems in plant breeding and genetics. I'm sure we'll probably hear about that more today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yu. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, when I speak uh, in front of the audience, I see all my professors sitting here, and I treat myself as a grad student and a postdoc. You know, I always feel like uh, if I interact with students, I stay younger, except I can dye my hair here. <laughs> but uh, uh, I have a talk designed for the audience. I know that this is agronomy and horticulture. I got to see many crops, multi-crop breeders, right? We have beautiful uh, research here. I'm very excited. I listed the three uh, titles so here it's just because of the more or less stable funding. I know some of the professors here have more stable funding. Do discoveries instead of be driven just by grant money. So I appreciate all this uh, funding. So integrating design analytics and genomics in crop improvement. I, I changed the titles. I'll share three major studies we've done recently. Uh, not just that you have to follow our lead, but also we really want to have the design and the thinking analytics into design of your own study, especially graduate student or postdocs. Uh, my position is quantitative genetics and maize breeding. Uh, we like to address the significant questions in plant breeding, the harder ones that are difficult to study, uh, but we'll give it a try both in terms of genomic te technology and the theory. And then this is because my uh, predecessors, they're all very famous professors, like some of the professors here, uh, George Sprague, and then started making synthetics. Uh, Bill Russell selected the B73, uh, that line that, uh, there's a history actually behind the B73 MOS 17 with Nebraska in 28. I, I think that some of your corn breeders or corn geneticists should dig up the, I'll share a story about N28. N28 from Nebraska saved or uh, pulled out the MO17. MO17 pulled out the B73. So Nebraska had made the huge contributions there too. Uh, so this is to show I have, you know, started in 2013 and try to make some progress. We really believe the power of quantitative genetics that it is not the old quantitative genetics of the variance component analysis or, or just the you know, breeding methodology. We try to really shift it, you know, towards the cutting edge genomic technologies, uh, try to combine with molecular biology. 
uh, after today's talk, maybe I have to update my statement to have designs analytics into this uh, statement. So how do we feed the uh, 10 billion? Because we all know the big context, you know, our research, right? By 2050, right, the world population will be 10 billion. Uh, this is a recent uh, review led by Lee Hickey. Uh, he happened to be the speed breeding uh, guy, speed breeding. Uh, and then they wrote uh, this review saying that uh, the plant breeding crop improvement as general will make uh, major contributions to secure the uh, food for the future generations. And then, so we know that in when we talk about plant breeding or crop improvement, we always trace back to the uh, domestication, right? Here, I think we have visiting students uh, from Turkey, right? From, and then here, when we domesticated the wheat and all barley, maize, potato, and then Mendel's law discovered in 1960s, rediscovered later on, and then we have cross breeding. These are the traditional plant breeding, right? We, it's all well known that what we are doing is build a mold tools, right? Gene transformation, democracy selection, and there's all other precision technologies try to increase the crop yield. Uh, when we say this plant breeding, we're not leaving agronomy soil scientists alone because it's, it's G by E by management. It's just because from, you know, geneticists, we like to, easier for us to manipulate the genetics. We talk about genetics breeding. Uh, if I highlight to the major things, the, the, the other review paper in the Nature Biotechnology, they talk about uh, sequencing genotyping. We have expert in oldings, soybean, and then maize, or maybe wheat too. Uh, genomic selection, you're gonna play a big role uh, in this uh, securing the food. And then we have expert in the genome editing, high throughput of phenotyping. I visited the beautiful high throughput of phenotyping greenhouse yesterday. It was one of the best, right? <laughs> it's wonderful. And then speed breeding, how do we manipulate the light intensity and then the photo period to have more cycles? And then the, how about the de novo domestication? This is all written by this uh, group of uh, scientists saying these are the major things. Well, you can add, actually, maybe you have new ideas. You can add uh, uh, more items, right? Okay, uh, as a non-native English speaker, when we have questions, we go to Wikipedia, right, or dictionary. So I did this, uh, my homework, design, okay? Design is a plan or specifications for the construction of object, system, something you try to build, some environment, systems, right? And then implementation of activity or process. This is the design. We see some of the design, right? I see that uh, this whole campus is designed to be big red, right? There's some cheering up or your stadium designed to win the games all the time. And then what about the analytics? I, I increased my grad student, and one of them say, oh, it's just a fancy word about analysis, <laughs> right? It turns out that analytics is a discovery, interpretation, communication, meaningful patterns in data, right? This is like analysis, same thing. But the difference is that it also entails applying data patterns to, towards effective decision making. Or well, analysis, analysis is just to show or will change your next step, right? And then further, I'll show that analysis is probably most of the time focused on understanding the past, right? You know, what happened or why it happened, why right? you figure out what, what is happening. But in analytics, people assign slightly different meanings, saying that why it happened, what will happen next. With analytics, we try to guide our next step, right? What about this design? <laughs> Not happy? Look at this girl, right? This design was uh, as a team, not only by the photographer, right? But also by the, the girl, right? You see the multiple uh, elements, multiple signs of Nebraska, right? Multiple signs, look here, right? And then all this cone head, right? Beautiful design. I mean, are you excited by this picture? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. What about this picture, right? Uh, you see this uh, tailor the suits, uh, square head. Uh, not, you know, this is supposed to be representing people with no imaginations, not very artistic, but the eureka moment, right? The butterfly come out. This turns out to be a New York Times uh, article talking about IBM. 
Amazingly, this company is be, gonna be one of the few, maybe the only company that survived or keep reinventing itself. It provides software, hardware, and service. It actually jumped on this design thinking and then it start reinventing itself, design centered strategy to set free of the squares. This behind this article is 2015. IBM, after they studied the design thinking, design thinking many years, they decided to hire a thousand designers to work with their engineers to, to focus on the custom experience. What about this spooky picture? This is still September, right? And not October yet, right? This is called the evolution of design thinking. It is said that it's not longer just a product. It is a user experience. It is a strategy, a management change. This was a picture from the Harvard Business Review. And all, lot, many of the CEOs read, read this journal, right? How do I stay relevant? How do I make a new progress, handle the changes that are happening in my company, right? And then this is all about uh, evolution of design thinking. Uh, even the people who, kept this term been around for many decades, but just re in the recent the past 20 years, people add more new meanings to design thinking. Your design or your thinking or design thinking. Uh, this happened to be the, you know, the picture or diagram I, I took from the Design Thinking 2017. This is the first annual meeting on design thinking, right? We went, you know, we all probably go to the ASA meeting, and PAG meeting, maze meeting, or soil meeting many times. This is the first meeting in design thinking, right? This design thinking really, I mean, you, you think, you know, it's nothing new, the same thing, but actually it's different. You see this uh, first step about design thinking is stress and emphasize fully understand the customer, the perspective of users, customer, or, or your, your question, the problem, right? It's a pair of hand holding a heart, right? It's not a pair of hand holding a lip, right? Because you have to feel the touching, you know, be together, get into this whole thing situation. And then most of the time when we are facing the problems, it's too broad, it's too lofty. You'll see we have some publications, it's like, it's hard to touch, right? This step of define, narrow down the big problem into some actionable plans, and then ideate from different perspectives. This is the critical prototype. Don't worry, you're gonna be attacked. Don't worry, people will laugh at you because you're gonna test, you're gonna iterate, you're gonna go round and round. Uh, after we study this for many years, we said, well, actually, every paper we publish is a design thinking prototype, right? Because somebody else is gonna publish another bigger paper, better paper, you know, more methodology, right? It's like a design thinking. So it said that a human-centered mindset and problem-solving strategies <laughs> that within beyond the design function of any business, industry, and profession. So really this says actually, uh, this will address complex problems, right? Uh, will actually achieve remarkable results. Uh, seriously, I mean, when I was a student, I think all my professors figured out everything already. <laughs> There's nothing left for me to do. But uh, when I became a professor, oh, there's many interesting questions that waiting everybody to figure out, right? Uh, so how to feed the 10 billion? It could be a very lofty problem, right? I mean, you could define, you can narrow down this to your own research saying, am I making contributions to, you know, a small piece in this big question, right? How do we design genomic assisted breeding approaches, right? I mean, further narrow down this question to a smaller scale so that I can still answer the question by making some contributions. Okay, I also read this paper like 10, 15 times. It's called the uh, uh, wicked problem in design thinking, right? This actually give a lot of interesting uh, things to me. Uh, the design and in, intentional operation, uh, the doctrine of the, uh, replacements, the wicked problem theory of design and design technology. Uh, this is actually too much for me to understand, so I take some quote. <laughs> you think about the, the problem designers is to conceive and plan what does not exist yet, right? Before your research being published, you know, it's not exist. You might be similar to somebody else, but your own research with your own material, your own design, your Nebraska environment does not exist. You I mean, every individual student postal, you're a designer too, right? Uh, design as a communication 
construction, strategic planning, and systematic integration. The design, we typically think about uh, the signs and symbols, right? You can design the actions, right? You can design this beautiful uh, meeting room, conference room, so that people pay attention to the speaker, right? You, you, you can make this uh, like, uh, you know, sofa chairs, people like lay back and take a nap, right? Uh, design really affect us, right? Uh, so here it says, a new liberal art of design thinking is turning the modality of impossibility, right? That challenged my non-English speaker, you know, uh, what does this mean, right? Modality of impossibility, something not possible, but will make it happen, right? That's a design. And then you also, you know, listen to this uh, talk sometime, you know, there's certain people that try to encourage us saying that high throughput sequencing will revolutionize plant breeding. I mean, that's, those are the people that are doing sequencing, right? They only work on sequencing, which is encouraging. But then some saying genomic selection, phenotyping, editing will revolutionize plant breeding. But seriously, if you are in crop improvement, agronomy, horticulture, we say well, exactly how to make this happen, right? It's just not technology gonna make this happen. It need more multiple steps to follow up to make this whole thing happen, right? Uh, so the, you know, with this current technology and an understanding resources, how do we actually realize this potential, right? So the problem designers or ours is to conceive plan what does not exist yet, right? This is all the, my introduction about design thinking. I'll show some examples later on to see that uh, some of these beforehand, some of that in retrospect, we try to understand. So here, design analytics to genomics. We'll show examples about uh, gene bank germ plasm space exploration. There's, you know, and then optimize the space exploration in hybrids. We'll sh also show some phenotypic plasticity. We call it a performance response surface. Uh, the thing about genetics is that's so interesting because genetics, we know the transgressive segregation, right? There's all so much possibilities to piece these SNPs, markers, gene together. One plus another environment makes it unlimited possibilities to make it happen. So uh, just brief introduction about the genomic prediction and the selection. You don't have to understand the technical side. The only thing we need to focus is that because of the geno genomics. Now make this potential, ma make this whole thing possible. Genomics unite, unify all the plant species, animals, and humans. And the genomic selection also allow us to study different crops, different species you, under a unified framework, okay? In genomic selection, we can predict this uh, genomic estimated breeding values. You can just say, predict the genomic, genetic merits. This is because we have model training, we can make a prediction, we can do selections. You don't have to worry about technical detail. So here, we, I briefly say this is because genomic selection or prediction model can be set up as left mixed model, right mixed model. They're equivalent, but left in mixed model assign the breeding values to individual, to in each individuals or genotypes or hybrids or inbreds, right? The right mixed model assign the breeding values almost to each markers, right? Genome of the mar wired marker index. So they're equivalent. You either assign the marker breeding value to each individual, they're connected by pedigrees, connected by the genomic relationship matrix, or you directly assign the breeding value to each markers. And each individual have different markers and you piece them together, right? So here, Genomic selection has been used in actual plant breeding. This uh, slide's probably outdated already. We studied this genomic prediction many years. It has been used in inbreed development, test cross evaluation, parental selection, and hybrid prediction, right? This is uh, because the genomics can allow us to optimize our resource use efficiency. For the pressures, uh, high super phenotyping can be done with a smaller sample of the training set or in the field. So they can predict the performance of a rather large bunch of individuals. Now we can do pre-selection first. So genomics make it happen, right? And uh, analytics. This is the paper we like to promote too, because this is the thing that we did. We, it's like prototype. People can 
laugh at what we did, smaller scale, or can do better things. But we say genomic prediction contributing to a promising global strategy to turbocharging banks. I'll go through this paper uh, that we, what we did briefly. Uh, I, I, I heard that some students visited the gene bank recently. This is the gene bank, the shelf with jars, right? These are the precious genetic material we saved, and then we have somewhat limited information that we can think of as a paper tag. This paper tag contains the race specification, site collection, uniformity, and then some information. You, you could also run genome selection, which Nebraska people did, with this gene bank information, right? But what we think we could do is that, I mean, we have experts try to turbocharge. Turbocharge is a term, <laughs> is to make the system efficient instead of just, you know, push more air into a combustion chamber, make it more run faster. But here we say that if we have this genomic technology, we can sequence all this germ plasm oxations. I heard that uh, they are going to sequence one X coverage of the 20,000 oxations of the uh, soybean oxations, right? What if we add more? phenotype information, and then predict this phenotype information for the large 20,000 oxations, make it more efficient. So it basically say that turbocharge is as if we are, you know, having this switching this paper tag to a golden got chip, right? I mean, this is actually most of the time in database, we don't attach a chip to there, but it's, it's similar. So from seed bank, we can add more information, and then we can use that information for public good. And then it's like a dollar sign here. Okay. So the design we had is, a, you know, this is a design we try to apply this design sync in retrospect, right? We have 44,000 locations in, you know, Solgram gene, gene bank uh, in Solgram. And then we narrowed down to 34,000 photopure sensitive Solgram to study. We're, at that time, we study the uh, photopure sensitive Solgram for biomass production. That's we narrowed down. And then we further narrowed down by working with the curators, gene bank curators, to 3,000 accessions, and then narrowed down to 1,000. Okay, this is our define. This is too much to study. And then we define to be 1,000. Then we did the genotyping by sequencing. From, with genotyping by sequencing, you know, genomics make it possible. And then we select a 300 accessions to study. And then we think we can project information outwards. You see, you narrow down the scoop and then you think you can actually, you know, uh, extrapolate information to large stations. We didn't do this. This is our thinking because this has to be done by well-coordinated large group, right? So uh, we did a GBS out of a thousand stations. We were able to obtain quality data about 962 and then we select the training set. In the earlier years, we called it selective phenotyping. But now you would call this uh, optimal training set design. You select a subset that most representative of this large set. And then you obtain the phenotype information about this smaller set. You do cross validations on different traits to give you the prediction accuracy, right? You get a feel of what's going on, the prediction accuracy with the current data. Once you have the confidence, then remember that here, you play with 300, if it's good, you're gonna predict the 700 individuals that outside of the 300, right? 1,000 minus 300 is 700 individuals. You're gonna make predictions, right? As an academic uh, scientist, we say, you make a prediction, who's gonna validate? Us, right? We're gonna go back to do the empirical validation. In the empirical validation, there's also a question of design because we have no resources to do evaluate the 700 accessions. We have only resources to evaluate the 200 accessions. There's another pick and choose process, another designing process. What we did is we picked up the predicted high, predicted low, the predicted biomass yield, 50 predicted high, 50 predicted low, and 100 in between. So we actually uh, 50, 50, 100, 200. And then we grew them in your field. We have observed the data. You see generally they are, you establish a correlation, right? You have correlation of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, which working. So at least the prediction is working. 
you can also complain that this prediction was not tight, right? I used to joke that, well, you can either, because genomics is uh, make it possible to do prediction, you can work with this prediction, or you can walk away without doing anything, right? So do not complain, this is not tight, uh, the correlation is not close to one, you should be happy if the correlation is at least not close to zero, point two, point three. This is because the power of prediction, right? When you make a prediction, you can make a prediction of thousands of individuals. This large number come into play. Even the correlation, let's say in the companies, is only 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Remember, you got, if you got a 3,000 individuals you predict, or 10,000 individuals predicted, you can still work with that low prediction accuracy because that gives you some information to leverage. Okay, after we done that research, it happened that we have a group of animal scientists, right, be friends with animal scientists. And then they published this paper called Upper Bound for Reliability. This measurement is beautiful because unlike the previous reliability estimate, this reliability only works on marker data set. Basically saying that how estimable of my prediction candidate based on marker matrix of training population. It's like a genomic, genomic relationship. If these individuals can be have higher reliability and then also higher prediction accuracy, that's happened to be the individual we selected. Once a mixed model, this is behind the, you know, under the hood, when the model start losing the confidence, they start with, you know, shrinkage towards the mean. That means you have some individuals, this U shape thing, that means if you have less confidence to make the prediction, they'll just say you are average, right? This U shape. It happened that we did a two empirical validation. This is an, another population less related to our training. You see the reliability is low and the prediction accuracy is much worse if you can check out the publication. So this is because the genomic relationship of your training and the validation population. So there's always these questions can be answered. Uh, then we say, well, look, I mean, if you can think of our study is small, but Nobody actually did similar things. I'm talking about empirical validation of green all this stuff, not just cross validation with the current data set, which a lot of people have done. Uh, so we can have this gene banks. Uh, what if we do sequencing? A lot of people have expert on this. What if we design a training set and a phenotype and a validate and then we extrapolate and then iteratively, remember iteratively, and then we're gonna have a lot more information in the gene bank. So that's a diagram we did uh, shamelessly to say that a small research as a prototype uh, can, can show the message forward, right? So here, just say the gene bank is this large. If you can sequence all the gene bank or genotype in the gene bank, you can select some representative individuals and then they can make pr comfortable predictions of their relative, like relative, so closely related individuals, eventually you should be able to fill the whole space because you have confidence about genetics, right? Genetics, what is driving, what's changing, right? Okay, the second example is uh, hybrids. Uh, when we start doing this project, this actually after we switched to corn, my position at uh, the earlier was example we did in Kansas, later on in Iowa. Uh, we were doing genome-wide association studies with this hybrid. It turns out that it's better to be done with the uh, prediction. Uh, here, this problem is not only faced by any breeders here, wheat breeders, soybean breeders here, and then sorghum breeders, but faced by the companies because on the X axis is the number of inbreds you have. On the Y axis is the number of hybrids you have. Remember, this is a thousand times here, right? If you have this many of inbred, your potential hybrid combination is gonna be exponentially going high. And then any companies, they won't be able to, uh, you know, have resources to test thousands of thousands of hybrids. So the option we have is either do test cross, right? Test cross turned out to be a, optimal design in the traditional sense about general combinability. But in this modern age, we think we can actually directly select an individual single cross to design its training population. 
So here, uh, the breeder has a question, sampling, uh, sample the training set to do genomic prediction. Uh, this slide is made by my postal Tinting Guo. He said, well, let's say you ask a statistician, right? <laughs> the question about uh, select samples. Uh, there's a lot of algorithms that are used by statisticians. One of them suit the purpose the best. It's about a partition among medoids. This is a clustering algorithm. You've used other class of algorithm multiple times. The beauty of this one is that once a cluster is done, it has a medoid, like a centerpiece or representative individual to represent in that whole cluster. So that can be directly used as a training set, right? So you don't have to select again, right? And then if you talk to the computer scientist who's networking on the, let's say, people's uh, Twitter networks or the Facebook networks, people send, uh, you know, try to sample uh, 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 social networks, right? How you sample a subnetwork or subgraph from a huge graph still representing the same structure, right? It turns out that uh, we studied, when we studied this one, we learned about Larry Page, the founder of Google. Uh, he actually had an algorithm to rank, uh, page rank, the different uh, internet pages. And then that's not working because they're ranked independently. And then we went on trying this uh, uh, D rank. We tried this forest fire. We tried this slash burn. We tried so many data mining technologies and we landed on this one called fast, unique, representative subset selection. It turns out that once we transform this problem from the optimal training set design into a computer science term called representative subset selection, then it opened up a lot of possibilities. We even bought a book called Data Mining. It will start telling us how many different data mining techniques can be used to select this representative subset selection. And then being a geneticist, right? <laughs> working with dye alleles, mm -hmm. working with the, you know, the design tool, we still can't get rid of this, uh, you know, uh, dye allele, half dye allele or design tool. We say, could we actually thinking that among all this possible hybrid combination, some are within hybrids, some are between hybrids, can we sample these individuals uh, to maximize the connectedness and diversity? I mean, there's a lot of more work to do, make this possible. So that's actually from statistics, computer science, and geneticists, different perspective, you can tackle the problem, right? So, uh, again, this one slide introduction about data mining, it turns out that we picked on this term data mining, we didn't pick on term machine learning. Uh, data mining is to uh, finding the patterns behind the data, right? The pattern discovery turned out to be uh, here, data mining pattern evaluation. Uh, in plant breeding, which is uh, really nice because once we find the pattern in the data, we do not stop there, right? This pattern can guide us to generate more data, which can be contain more information to mine again. So it's, it's an iterative process. So data mining being used in many different areas, okay? And then here, we, let, we did a very uh, small example. We studied this uh, 25 NAM founders that crossed together, this maze hybrids. Uh, and then we tried to do this cluster PCE analysis to say this temperate um, uh, maze and then tropical maze and subtropical maze. And then once we, uh, we, once we completed the hierarchical cluster analysis of the inbreds, and then we see the hybrids that was forming these clusters, right? This is the genetic, you know, genomic relationship among this pairwise inbred. So this is a pattern about the genetic relationship. These are the pattern of the hybrid performance. We try to match this genetic relationship with hybrid performance, right? The details why I skip. Just basically, if you start establishing this genomic relationship matrix with this hybrid performance, you can sample them differently. Uh, we focus on this uh, data mining uh, method called the FIRST, PAM, Maxim CV. 
So it turns out that the prediction accuracy could be generally better than random selection sample. All this PV mean and the CD mean, CD mean. Uh, this PV mean and CD mean is the traditional reliability estimate. We have to adapt this method from inbred to hybrid. And then to show that these other three methods is better than these two. So these are the uh, hybrids. And then this are the, we also try to make it more generalized. We work on this a data set published by other scientists in wheat. You notice the difference in, in corn, this, uh, seg, uh, this separation is uh, very obvious. But in wheat, which is a crop, have not established, uh, well established the divergence patterns between the two groups. They're all uh, somewhat less diverged, group one and group two. By studying this relationship, genomic relationship with the hybrid performance, you see this is the hybrids, right? The inbred, an inbred has relationships. The hybrid and hybrid can also have relationships. Here you see that uh, the PAM and maximum CD performs better, right? I mean, forget about technical details, just saying that data mining can help you do your job better. And then we work on this uh, uh, rice hybrids. Uh, there are separations of the, if you're just looking at the indica by indica, there's a two group of separations of the male, female uh, uh, rice. And then this uh, first and the PAM is uh, still generally better than the previous three methods. Okay, uh, I'll just summarize this uh, message is that because we have to deal with numbers, right? Because the training set, we have limited resources. We have to optimize to make sure that our training set contains as much information as possible. So with representative subset selection, effective genomic prediction can be accomplished within only two to 13% of the whole set. We, this actually puzzled us. The two to 30% of the whole set, what is the whole set? It just says that if you have a targeted whole set, if you use this data mining technology, if you reach, you know, two to 13%, if you have too many training sample size, doesn't matter, you just random sample, right? If you have a small number of training sample, you need to be very, you know, careful about selecting your uh, sample. Uh, here is a diagram to show that, you know, sometime, the moment we decide to do experiment, we might regret. We could have done that better, right? We had a good night, a good discussion uh, yesterday evening at the dinner, right? We always saying, did we do the best? No, we could have changed this whole thing, right? Design thinking saying, then don't worry, right? It's okay. Uh, if you do this one, you're gonna change later on, right? Data mining is also an uh, iterative process because we, we generate the data, we analyze the data, we're gonna redesign our experiment, we're gonna generate data again. And then if this uh, plant breeding of crossing, phenotyping, genotyping, all this process, iterative process. So after we understand design thinking, we're, we're, we have less worries because it's just first step, right? Uh, this is a, one of the major study I'll try to show here. Uh, this study, we spent eight years. That was uh, extremely exciting. I, if you are grad student postdocs, I really recommend you read this paper five times. <laughs> because I, it just, seriously, we spent so much time on this one. You can QTO mapping, prediction, environmental, physiology. It, it's going to make your reading enjoyable because we just put so much time. I mean, some of the things we learn after we publish, we, I still read my papers, I'm trying to understand. <laughs> you know, we, we had this title, a uh, little bit arrogant, we say it was uh, genomic and environmental determinants and that their interplay under underlying phenotypic plasticity. Uh, it is because that we did something that was so exciting, right? Uh, let's say I, I give talks, I say this is the most elegant 3D image. I encourage all the students to have a mental image every time because it's like design thinking. Things are too complicated. We vary so much. But if you guys just squeeze your genotype information to one dimension, don't worry about the multi-dimension. I know it's small and large P. <laughs> Environment also squeeze into one dimension. Don't worry about soil type or you know, rainfall. Just squeeze in one dimension because that helps you to understand. Your performance is a landscape. 
up and down everything, right? So if we think about this design thinking, this training sample, if we somehow masterfully design some representative genotype that also, you know, phenotyped under this representative environment, then we have these samples to build a nice landscape, right? We can extrapolate everything in between, right? That's the idea about this 3D elegancy of the 3D. So in plant breeding, we also talk about target population of genotype and target population of environment. You understand the thing you're talking about is only working within this comfortable zone. If you want to go out, you need to be careful. Uh, this idea about this thing is that in most of times we have limited resources. We have tested genotype under test environment, right? If we do a good job of detecting the pattern within this tested environment, test the genotype, what we really want to do in the future is untested the genotype under untested environment. Because genomics allow you to manipulate tons of individuals, candidates. You want to narrow down the individuals that are being planted for this untested environment, right? Screening process. So we know that what is difficult is to establish the, you know, the relationship between the testing environment and the future environment, right? You know, who would ever predict the 2019 have delayed the flowering of the wheat and then maybe high temperature speed up, narrow down the flowering time window to a week? It's hard to predict, right? But if you somehow you can make this prediction, that's why we want you to have one dimensional thinking, make it simplify. This is less a problem because we have trust in genetics, genomics, right? Genomics, genetics, you know, genomic prediction can get this uh, connected. The key thing is to have established this relationship. And then once this relationship is established, we'll be able to do this uh, predicting and forecasting, right, for the future. Uh, this is also related to my uh, position change. I was at Kansas State 12, 11. We have the experiment here. We were in winter nurseries. We see this flowering time switch of these two inbreds and also the populations, the real populations. Uh, people just laugh at me saying, all oh, breeders know that, no big deal, right? But we stick, you know, we, we, we stayed on working on this project for another seven years. And then we find this uh, beautiful uh, story. And then I moved to Iowa, Iowa 13 and 14. It turns out that, let's say, if I explain this figure on the x-axis different, let's say in different environment, this is flowering time, these are the two inbred parents, and then these other lines are the progenies, recombinant, recombinant inbred lines. Uh, you see this P and T, uh, P is uh, red, uh, T is blue. This blue line have this performance. The red line is going up and down, and then down here. So, uh, I have a 14, this switch pattern, flowering time, a pattern, really interesting. And then, uh, this is just supposed to get you confused on the pattern. But if you sort it with the average performance of the flowering time, you resolve the two crossover to one crossover. And then you see that I have a 14 because it was cold. It started performing like PR, Puerto Rico 12 and 11, right? We have a a similar environment here, but then this Puerto Rico 14S, this summer Puerto Rico, is start mimicking uh, temperate, right? Kansas, Iowa weather, right? But then what we did here is a uh, friendly vacancy, Eberhard Russell joint regression analysis. We use this average performance of each environment as X axis. We call population mean. It could also be called the environmental mean. Uh, and then became you know, this zigzag line, because this is categorical, this is numerical, you can see this uh, response, right? This is called uh, relatively stable, this is called the plastic, right? The key thing now, because earlier I said, the key thing is to establish this relationship, right? Uh, also, the key thing is because, remember I said, the difference between analysis and analytics. If we do analytics, we want to do prediction for the future. We want to do the forecasting in the future. We need to replace this population mean, which can all be obtained after experiment, right? We need to replace this x-axis. So the whole thing we're doing to replace this population mean. 
okay, we talk with uh, philologists, crop modelers. It turns out uh, the photothermal time during the early, uh, earlier stage can be perfectly allow us to replace that earlier population mean. This thinking actually we have later on. So instead of uh, using this whole population, if we treat this population as a whole, I have 250 lines, I treat as a single genotype. And then uh, this population mean is here, a population mean is here, I have seven dots. And then I try to find the photosomal time from different uh, stage of the groups, try to mimicking this seven population mean. That means these seven dots give me the purely environmental effect because I have single genotype, which is a single population, right? Then we run a bunch of correlation to find out that actually at this uh, uh, 18 to 45 days, this photosomal time, which I show here, is GDD times day length, will be able to give up correlation of 0.996. Did I see that here? And then once we get this correlation, we will, we'll, I'll have another animation to show how we get it. But let's say we get a correlation. Now here, this is a similar picture from previous slides, but now it changed to a photosomal time, which is the environmental index became a parameter. Now we don't have to draw on the performance data. Using performance data, find the index, can do predictions. Okay. Uh, we call this called a critical environmental regressor through in, informed search. Uh, it, it will be difficult to understand the slides, but you can enjoy the animation first at least. Uh, basically, we lay out this uh, uh, seven environment uh, here. Why, you know, this actually takes longer to flower. This average of population flower. This is the flower earlier, right? We try to have build the windows. If you know how to program, you build a two loops. This loop to go through the process. We basically say that population mean is going to stay seven dots, stay on this y axis. We only change our environmental index, searching different windows to find the window that match perfectly. So here I'll start, we start with one to four days if that's representative of the whole season. We're finding this window of the season to be, to be representative of the whole season. One to seven days. You see, when I do this one, this, this, this dots shift. I start building this. Uh, so, some of my, you know, students discourage saying we're just running tons of correlations. <laughs> but that's exactly you. You have to know what you try to find with correlations, right? Okay, here we have this correlation. Uh, it's uh, eighteen to forty-three days of that in all the environment. Give me the best predictions. 0996. People say, what well, about a soil type? What about other rainfall? I say, well, if you have a correlation 0996, you don't need anything else. For now, for now, for this simple trace, right? we will need that for green yield, for other trace, right? We'll need soil type for other complicated situation. But our, our like design thinking, let's, let's finish this prototype. Let's finish this simple case first. Okay, so Remember, once you replace this performance-based whatever in the past with this environment index, we can make predictions. We can also show that now this is the photosomal time. Each genotype, its response became a reaction norm. This time a reaction norm of some genotypes that are less responsive to the environmental change. Some genotype is a plastic. They're so sensitive to environmental change, right? And then you can do this prediction uh, from tested to untested, uh, you can hold the environment the constant, change the genotypes, you can change both the genotype environment, making predictions. Uh, this correlation is going to be high for sure because this prediction contains the environmental effect. In plant breeding, we typically eliminate, remove this environmental effect when we calculate the intriming based heritability and other things, but no, no, we need to bring that back, okay? We also can think of the photosomal time is my environmental input. My marker effect called the genome, my the marker index, this genetics is changing under different environmental input, right? I mean, we have discussion about some mature genes in soybean, they change, right? Some of the genetic effect is stable, some change dramatically. And then you can, this actually correspond to my right mix model, the earlier 
pick a slide showing left, left mixed model, assign breathing value to individuals, or assign breathing value to markers, right? So uh, let's say we have the survey environment to build the model, and then we group the same population in IVA 15 and IVA 16. So this is IVA 15 is here, IVA 16 here. And then we do this predicted flowering time, observed flowering time, the correlation point eight, correlation point eight. So we actually do the extra seasons to validate the model have prediction powers, right? We want everything eventually to be on the diagonal, which is on target. We understand why this little bit off target, right? This can be fixed if we have better understanding of the window search, dynamic flexible windows instead of the clear cut windows. Uh, then what, what really interesting of this research and plus earlier two, you know, those two examples I show is to understand the environment, right? If you look at the Kansas, we did the Kansas 11, 12, maybe in that location, the combinations of photo period and temperature change is a narrow range. Uh, Iowa, right? Ames is, if you're breeding uh, the, the, the wheat in here or soybean here are uh, successful. Sometimes it's probably because the, the breeders are excellent, but also because the environment keep changing. So yeah, your, your variety is robust, right? You see the Ames, uh, it's changed the, this uh, photosomal time changed from Iowa 14 here, 15 here, 16, it covered wide range, almost covered the switch. This is the one is P, one is T, right? So then for the breeders, if, if I have to optimize the sampling process, right? I would have put more locations in Iowa, less in Kansas to saturate my comfortable zone. Remember this target population of environment, right? If I, if I base on historical weather average, do I target to some places that give me different variations, I narrow down this variation, right? Breeding companies would study this to optimize the testing sites. Okay. Uh, I got a lot of questions. We did not show the gene effect change, but I, eventually you can use GWAS with the environmental dimension and genomic selection under this environmental dimension. Uh, you can profile a gene effect. If you have mutants, anything, as long as you figure out the environment, G by E environment interactions, you can profile the gene effect. You can focus in the crop performance. It works for maize and rice, because I mean, everything I said here, because we play with some data first, we know it's working, right? For this to bring to publication stage, need time, but all this is gonna be work. I, I tell people why it works, because two things, because earth is rotating and revolution because photothermal time, either photo or thermal, those two has to be the major packed factors. The precipitation, rainfall is also important, but the pattern is less predictable. So the temperature and the photo period are more predictable. That's why all the plant has to adapt to this Earth's rotation and revolution. revolution. Uh, we get a group of highly talented uh, and dedicated scientists, Xianyan Li, a uh, adjunct associate professor, Tingting Guo is a, was a postdoc, now is a research associate. Uh, Xin Li, he's a, he's a grad student uh, that studied the uh, photosomal time and then figured out uh, this uh, foreign time. And then we have other collaborators. Pash Noble is the PSI director. He actually selected the faculty scholars, you know, supply us with, you know, more, more or less stable support to do dedicated research to certain areas. Uh, we have lots of collaborators funded by different agencies. Okay, uh, integrating design analytics and genomics in crop improvement. I'm going to leave you this is diagram. We know that I don't do crop cultivar development. I don't do hybrid release, but I know I appreciate that you like to talk with breeders because they deliver this final product, right? I mean, every time we talk, it's just like uh, providing the tools and you know, possibilities. They have this uh, better product creation, right? But then if now we talk about big data, you know, digital agriculture, we all we do is knowledge discovery from data, right? But then if we introduce the design thinking, design into this whole thing process, optimal, uh, program design. Now, we really think about 
art, science, business, engineers. This number scheme now be not because of just number of plot and locations, but also the data points, the design, the information contained in my data. This whole thing has to be combined together, right? Uh, I get a few stuff here, but I'll leave you with this slide.